That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Babylon, the fifth film directed by Damien Chazelle, which Paramount Pictures is releasing December 23rd, 2022. We made a review for this movie like a month ago. When I first saw it, yeah. And I had not seen it. I'm going to leave that review up because I think it's fine. Um, and I feel like it's very similar to what we're going to say right now. Pro <laughs> Except this time I've seen the movie. Yes, which I appreciate your input because I feel like previously it was just a lot of me rambling on about all the things. I do really, it's not a perfect film. I really like this film. Seeing it a second time, I, I still feel that way about it because Chazelle takes a big swing and I, I think we have to appreciate that. And I would much rather see uh, cinematic ventures going in this realm. The director, what do I know from them? Well, I was surprised that I did like this so much because I really didn't like La La Land. Uh, oh. But previous to this, he also his last feature was First Man. Again, technically uh, astute, but I was very bored by that film. Uh, Whiplash, I, I still stand behind, is an excellent film, which J.K. Simmons won his Best Supporting Actor Oscar for. Uh, Chazelle's first film was Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. Uh, yeah. Okay, the basic story, it's set in like the 1920s, early 30s in Hollywood, and we focus on the transition from silent film to the talkies. And the story revolves around four characters. Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Diego Salva. Diego Calvo. Calvo. Calva, sorry. Calva. And Jovan. Adepo. Adepo. And with some other various sprinklings in there. Brad Pitt plays like the world's largest or like biggest movie star in the silent uh, era. Like in original matin matinee idol, his name is Jack Conrad, but he's clearly an amalgamation of people like John Gilbert and Douglas Fairbanks Jr., etc. Margot Robbie plays a young lady who wants to be an actor. Uh, Diego Cal Calva mm -hmm. plays a young man who wants to work on set. And Javon is a jazz musician. Okay. So the opening of the film is this big decadent party. And Margot Robbie's character crashes the party. And Diego is there because he's working for some executive. Don Wallach, played by Jeff Garland. That's whose party it is, actually. And he helps her finagle her way in. And an actress who's supposed to be like filming the next day parties too hard and can't perform so they tell margot robbie's character like go home and get some sleep because you need to be on set in three hours so she's like whoop and therein begins her career brad pitt's character gets so drunk that he needs a ride home and his boss or uh diego's boss says you take brad pitt home and brad pitt likes diego so he's like hey do you want to accompany me the next day on a film set a separate film mm -hmm. set for margot rock but all together they're all, all that's, that's filming together the studio is called kinoscope in this film therein begins diego's career and jovan he his character has nothing to do except play the saxophone he has one sort of meaningful scene i believe which is where doesn't he play the trumpet or a, a, he plays an instrument like a jazz instrument he is performing for a film and the rest of the band is black Javon's black and the rest of the band's black but they're darker skinned and some executive says like you're me hey because uh, now at this point Diego's like an executive telling Diego like hey your guy he's too fair skinned for the types of markets that we're going to sell this movie to he cannot be that light so Diego has to ask Javon to do blackface so that's you know probably the biggest plot point for that character but it's all just about how like hollywood back then was like the wild wild west like everything went just to get these pictures made and we can talk about very memorable moments which there are several yeah but just to wrap it up brad pitt realizes he's washed up and kills himself like blows his brains out because it's important to note that the transition from the talkie from for silent films to the talkies most of them did not make it Margot Robbie's character becomes a very big star, but her dad, played by Eric Roberts, is mismanaging her money, and she has a gambling problem. So she ends up getting in trouble with, like, a bad guy, played by Tobey Maguire. And she's told, if you don't get him his money, he's going to, like, pour acid on your vagina. 
So she runs to Diego for help because she and Diego, they're not really a couple throughout the film. Their, their lives are kind of separate but connected, but she always had a, a fondness for him and he clearly was enamored by her. So, or with her. So she at the very end asked for his help and he's like, well, bitch, I don't have $85,000. So we need to run to Mexico. And she realizes that she's always going to be a burden to him. So she like flees in the middle of the night and we find out she basically kills herself. Which is exactly what, after she visits her mother in the sanatorium, she says that's what she's going to do. She's going to dance off into the night. And that's what we see her do. And Diego, after Margot leaves, he, one of the henchmen for Tobey Maguire, almost kills him but says, get out of LA and never come back. So that's what he does. And then Jovan is just... He's the only one who sort of kept his nose clean. Like, there, we never see any issues with him. So I think there's a point to that, which is that if you sort of follow the rules and stay in your lane, you can have a career. Well, he after that blackface scene, he walks away. It's almost like if you walk away before you lose your soul, you'll be okay. Because that's what this Hollywood system does to people. And then the final sort of scene of the film is like 20 years later. So in the 50s, we see Diego return to L.A., back to Kinoscope and with his wife and child and he's basically telling them like i used to work here and then there's like a montage he, while he's watching a film singing in the rain notably that we get like memorable moments from cinema like actual films we know the end um i thought i think the film's good it's doing a lot it's long it feels long, but it wasn't difficult to get through. It's three hours and eight minutes. But 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 it but it is long, and it does feel chaotic because we have these four characters who really aren't ever fully developed. I think they're all being used to tell a bigger story, and I think in that way it's effective. But I I did leave the film wanting. How I felt about it is the scores. Amazing. Uh, yeah, Justin Hurwitz's score, the the track Voodoo Mama in particular, which I think is playing into you know Marlena Dietrich uh, dancing to in, in Blonde Venus dancing to Hot Voodoo. But there's a lot. Of, so so there's that. I also think the Brad Pitt character and that storyline that felt like that should have been a different movie about a silent movie star who has to face the facts. Like, he, as in the artist, that he's not going to transition to talkies. Which I know we have a movie like that, but if I guess because of his star power, Brad Pitt's, and as much time as we spend with his character, I almost felt like I wanted him to have his own thing. So then if you remove him, then we have these other three characters, one of whom, Jovan, we don't do much with. And then I really don't understand Diego's motivation for anything except that he says he wants to work in the pictures. And then Margot Robbie's character just wants to be a star. And then... At one point, we're told she's made millions of dollars and it was all squandered. <clears throat> I feel like that's a really big story that needs to be told within her story that we don't get, except that we know that her dad is an idiot and probably... Played by Eric it. Roberts, yeah. So there's that. There are a lot of moments I thought we didn't need. Like there's a like lesbian uh, lounge singer slash filmmaker. Lee Jun <laughs> Lee plays uh, Lady Fei Zhu. And to me, that's also collapsing. Like my, She had her opening number... Uh, at this party, the the opening, the opening party is very much doing Marlena Dietrich in Morocco with a tuck, smoking a cigarette and having a lesbianic moment. But it's not giving mixed with Anna Mae Wong in Shanghai Express. That opening number of hers, I I know they think they were giving us something, but I I didn't get anything. It, it, I didn't think it was sexy. The lyrics are like something about my girl's pussy, and mm -hmm. I thought it was real I, basic. I think we're. Sure, yeah. But at the same time, it's probably more realistic about what was, you know, scandalous and kind of cutting edge at the time. And it feels very realistic to, rather than being overly exaggerated. Yeah, but she's, well, okay, except that she's performing that song while there are people having sex. Like, I mean, there's nudity, there's fecal matter. I mean, this is not like her performing this song in front of a stuffy crowd. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah up in there, and she's doing this little number in a tuxedo that really didn't feel that edgy. So moments like that didn't work for me. But it, to me, yes, sure. But it, I think he's Chazelle is showing that it's you know like Weimar Weimar era 
uh, Berlin where this, for this very brief moment in time, this decadence where anything goes, where uh, no matter what ethnicity you were or sexual orientation, there was a place for you to go and be accepted before that all comes crashing down a la like Babylon. Also based on the previous review we did where I heard you talk about the movie, I assumed it would be much more extravagant and luxe, but it, it doesn't feel that. I mean, the opening big party... I, I think it's fun because of the music, but if you were to take the music away, it's like that video of Taylor Swift when it's like, y'all crash Ticketmaster over this and it's her squeaking around. If you remove the music or the score from that party, it's not that, like, I mean, visually, it's not that enticing. So another critique I heard was that it doesn't feel like LA, and I agree. Most of it takes place in the desert, but it is the 1920s. And I do understand that the filmmaker was trying to make it seem like it was the wild, wild west. So that does read. Yes. Yeah. Nothing was developed. Nothing would really be what we think of it as right. now. So I, so, so I think you have to remember that the, the way we see like, like the golden era of Hollywood and old Hollywood glamour, this period was not that. Like this, like this region and what was happening is not that. Very much by the seat by the seat of their pants. They didn't know what they were doing, and then, uh, which, you know, like the film Singing in the Rain, speaks directly to this time about the difficulties of transitioning to sound. You know, Al Jolson's the jazz singer lands, and people lose their minds and want sound. But a lot of these people, the 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 style of acting, of course, in the silent era was much different. But getting to the positives, there are several memorable scenes to me. Uh, the first is when Diego and Margot get to the film sets. First off, Margot, the director, is a female director, and she's very disappointed when she sees Margot because the character she's supposed to be playing is supposed to have large breasts, and Margot doesn't. But then she decides to use her, and it turns out that Margot's character can act. Mm -hmm. Like, she can cry on cue, and there's a pretty long scene where the director is making her cry in these really elaborate ways that make no sense, but it was fun to watch. Because mm -hmm. Robbie's game. Yeah, yeah, she's desperate and willing to work, and I actually thought the actor playing the director was also fun. I think that's Chazelle's actual wife, and that was giving me very much Dorothy Arzner, who was one of the original studio-era directors and uh, lesbian that was obsessed with Joan Crawford. So I get a lot of um, Joan, who was in silent films, from this Nellie Leroy character, who's also modeled after Clara Bow, the original It Girl. Because we get that female director in like two more scenes, but I thought that was a lot of fun, and then... <laughs> When Diego gets to set, because Brad Pitt's just a big talker, but he's his. I actually really liked his character. He's I a do. really nice guy. A drunk. He's a drunk, but you know, and he's telling another production person like, because he's like, I don't know what to do. We have to wrangle these extras, and Brad Pitt's character is like, Oh, Diego can do it. The kid can do it. Yeah, yeah he can do it. And then Diego's like, Yeah, I can do it. And it turns out it's like a score of like homeless guys from Skid Row who are like really violent and aggressive and watching Diego wrangle them. I thought that was a really funny scene. Uh, then we get a big battle scene. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a, a German director played by Spike Jones that I think is very much supposed to be like Joseph von Sternberg and his uh, difficult ways. And then, and then the producer friend of Brad Pitt's character is uh, George played by Lucas Haas. Who's like suicidal. Every scene we get him in, he's suicidal because some woman rebuffed him. Which I think that Haas is very interesting casting because he's notoriously Leonardo DiCaprio's best friend and is always tagging along in all of DiCaprio's film productions. So we also meet Jean Smart as like a gossip columnist and mm -hmm. she's, you know, she has a lot of texture because she's kind of... I, would would you say she's trying to be glamorous or yeah in in that way of the template of for like Hedda Hopper and Luella O Parson Luella O Parsons I don't know if she's supposed to be British because the accent work I wasn't the most I would, couldn't even have told you she was trying to be British okay other memorable scenes when Margot's character oh were you going to talk more no. about uh, and that female director they're trying to film a movie with sound their first time yeah and it's. It's more complicated than you would think because everything has to be quiet. Everything has to be perfectly on cue. Like they, and it's hot and they can't have air conditioning because that makes sound. And just how tensions run real high. 
I think like the sound guy ends up dying from a heat the stroke. The cinematographer. The cinematographer. And then the the sound guy arguing with the assistant director, arguing with Michael Robbie. It was all a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, fun to watch, but it means it looks like a horrible situation to be in. And they but, get like this one scene of just like, so, that's so banal and inconsequential and they're so... <laughs> and then when they finally, because I think after the ninth or eighth take, they get it. And... Margot Robbie, she delivers it. Mm -hmm. It was actually... Because as the audience, I'm also sitting there like, geez, like, can we get through this Mm -hmm. scene? And when she finally hits it, it was very relieving. Mm -hmm. Then, Tobey Maguire, I don't know what... (laughs) He was a lot of fun because he looks like he's dying from, like... Like he's been poisoned. His skin is... He's so creepy. And then he gets excited because Diego goes to him and try to talk, talk some sense into him about Margot Robbie... And then when Tobey Maguire realizes that Diego's a film executive, he wants to tell him about his film ideas. And he takes him to this, like, the underbelly of L.A., Mm -hmm. which is so grimy. I mean, it culminates with this big muscle man eating live rats. And watching Tobey Maguire's character get excited about it, like, we're going to make movies with this guy, I thought was really effective. Well, and also how this transition happened, this, this moral code, the Hayes Code, is shaping Hollywood, and all of these hedonistic parties had to go underground, and then it's almost like a descent into hell, literally, with different things happening at different levels of this party that's just disgusting. Another good scene is they're trying to revamp Margot Robbie's image, and they take her to like an event with all these stuffy like New York theater type people, and she goes, she tries her best. I don't know why they thought she could, her character could do it, like that she could stay composed, because they're belittling her, and finally she's like, I can't take it. And the way she goes off on those people, it's really funny. Um, well, and also at that party, there's a couple things going on about how Diego Calva, uh, He's trying to reinsert himself as not because he's from Mexico, his family's Mexican, and he's like telling people he's from Spain. And then Giovanna Depo is in, in there, and he's having to talk to all these white people about this new surge of race pictures and how great that is, and just kind of how these others are completely diminished in this artificial atmosphere. Yeah. Then uh, when Brad Pitt realizes, well, so he has a conversation with Gene Smart's character, and she gets him together like. Because he calls her a cockroach. Because she writes a scathing article about how he's kind of over. And she explains to him how Hollywood works. How people like her, people who stay in the background, stay in the shadows, they persist. Like cockroaches. The watchers persist. Whereas whereas someone like you, your flame burns bright for a second and then it's out. But then you have to remember that your legacy, like these pictures will live on forever. Like people will randomly pick up a movie or see it on TV and you'll be remembered. So... I thought that was very good, and then that transitions to him going to a party, and he, the Asian lady is saying her goodbyes because she got a big opportunity overseas, and he realizes it's done, and he walks into his hotel room and shoots himself. And he's also a chronic Lothario. He always has a wife. To There's always a new lady on his arm. We meet him uh, with Olivia Wilde at this party, castigating him, asking for a divorce because she's tired of him pretending. I thought her scene was good. Pretending he's Italian, which is so funny because Brad Pitt speaking, trying to speak Italian in Inglorious Bastards is so. I don't know if you're... Arrivederci. He does better in this movie. Yes. Um, uh, and then Catherine, Catherine Watterson is this Broadway star that he marries for a short while who's just very snippy and uh, pretentious. There's another shooting scene where... Because there is a actress who looks just like Margot Robbie. Sa- Samara Weaving. Samara Weaving. She is kind of like a hot starlet, but Margot's like encroaching on her stuff. So they're shooting a movie together. And... And then that female director is the one directing it. And I thought that was a good scene where they're kind of like... Because then Margot Robbie's... <laughs> upstaging her. Upstaging her. And then Samara Weaving's character is funding the movie. So Margot's trying to destroy it. So she goes and has like fake surgery to shut down production. <laughs> so there's a lot about the film I liked. And another fantastic scene is... Uh, there's this other party sequence. And you can already sense this change because they're trying to revamp... Uh, Nellie Leroy's image and Jean Smart saying you need to wear more clothes you can't look like that and she Nellie overhears some men talking about calling her trash and a slut basically and that kind of allows her to act out and she challenges Eric Roberts her father at the party to To fight a snake to fight a rattlesnake because he's he's always making these has these tall tales so all these drunk ass people from this party hop in their car go drive out in the desert find a rattlesnake Eric. And he, Eric Roberts is too drunk to fight the snake and literally passes out next to it. So Margot's upset and she's like, I'll fight the snake. And that's a really funny scene because, of course, the snake gets her ass. It latches onto her neck 
And then everyone's running around like crazy people. And to me, that reaches the heights of like Howard Hawks, just the scene even of, you know, like bringing up baby with these, the slapstick and these wild animals. And uh, I, I don't know, it, it just, it hits something that so few things do even though it's obviously paying homage to all these other greater artists. I would say this movie needs to be watched in a theater. Mm -hmm. And if you do watch it at home, you need to be well rested and no distractions. Um, but yeah, I would, I would recommend it. I just, I, I think I, what I needed was something to center the story that moved the idea of Hollywood forward. Meaning like, I know there's a studio executive in the film, but he's very Irving peripheral. Th Irving Thalberg. Max Minghella plays the actual Irving Thalberg. Almost everybody else is, a f you know... I wish that character composite. would have been front and center, and they're sort of the ones pulling all the strings and how we see all these different people's lives affected by this Hollywood machine. I, I, I needed something in the center because it just feels chaotic. Like, it's just four random people who don't really have a real storyline. We don't really know who they are, which we don't need to if there's something sort of tethering it together. I agree. And I think Manny Torres, as Diego, Diego Calvo's Manny Torres, I don't know how well I feel he is the glue between them all. No, and I, I didn't... He's okay. He didn't... I just... For how much screen time he gets, I didn't... I don't feel like he gave me what I needed either. I think he's striking to look at. Uh, but again, I, I think he didn't have as much to do either. You know, it's interesting to note because it culminates with where Chazelle is really getting to, where he, he's, we find that he's directly referencing like the Gene Hagen character in Singing in the Rain as we get that montage at the end. And, you know, Singing in the Rain was not a huge hit at the time it came out and since has become like that. Uh, and I'm also kind of reminded of Peter Bogdanovich's Nickelodeon uh, from 1976, which was not a hit either, but is speaking to these early days of cinema. And I think Babylon will feel like that. I, I don't know that it's easily going to find an audience, but I think years from now people will appreciate the artistry that, that's going on. And kind of this, again, this Paolo Sorrentino-ish score that is so bombastic, but I think so fantastic. What would you give it? I, well, I, as I maintained in my last review for, I, I, again, it's not a perfect film, but it swings very hard. Uh, and I, I just think in this day and age, you really have to appreciate that and the crassness and the vulgarity that I know a lot of people have already had a problem with in these previous yeah, well, I don't think it's that crass or vulgar. Well, with all the bodily, you know, like people were upset. At, what are the bodily functions? We see an elephant shit on a man. I, well, notably, it's shitting on a Mexican, and people were upset about that. That's crazy. Speeding. Who else would be pushed? I mean, they hired these people to move the damn elephant. I mean, that's who the elephant shit on. And then. Other than that, where do we see... Well, Margot Robbie vomiting and... Mar Yo, there is a scene where the, the, the stuffy New York theater crowd, she vomits on one of them. But it's like cartoonish. Yes. And then, what, what else is there? There's not... There... Well, the, the scene where Brad Pitt's in the bathroom and he's first told about sound film and somebody's like... You're... And you hear like somebody's shitting and he's like, do you really want sound in your film? You hear a fart. Like, yeah, you hear like explosive diarrhea. <laughs> but I don't think it's that vulgar. The language is not that vulgar. There's no sex. I mean, we see sex in the periphery, like people humping on each other. But yeah, I don't think this movie is that vulgar. I don't think so either. But I, I from the little thing, the complaints that I'd already heard after the first screening when I said I really liked it. The things people, people like, oh, tolerate God. from their school board members, but then, oh, we, oh, can't, right. see, yeah. we can't see a, an elephant take a shit. Anyway, I would give this movie three and a half out of five. And, it and, is very good. And kudos to the cinematographer, Lina Sandgren, and the film editor, Tom Cross, who won an Oscar for edit editing... Uh, uh, Whiplash, because I'd imagine that based on this gargantuan script and putting this together, uh, you know, again, maybe it is messy, but I, I like a glorious mess. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>